Uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, I also need to thank the organizer who have this amazing meeting. And uh, uh, also known as Albert, and, and uh, I'm a PhD student in her medical school, Glad uh, Gladyshire Lab. And today we'll talk about uh, our recent work on the causal biomarker and uh, service framework. So earlier today, um, Dr. Yu just gave a very interesting question, like, what's your favorite anti-aging therapy? So if you think about current known anti-aging therapy, you will, you will notice that they're, they're actually not, not novel. So if you look at calorie restriction, it's actually first been studied in 1946 for studying nutrients. And rapamycin, everyone like rapamycin, but it was first introduced as an antifungal, antifungal agent. 1975, and so on, and so on, and so on. So the point is, like, if not all, but most of the anti aging therapy are already studied for something else, like a while ago. And uh, a point, and, and there potentially there are also something we, like, people already studied, but we don't know they have, they have any their own age. So the point is, why don't we do a screening, right? If, if we can screen all the public data set, if we can screen all the experiments, we can find, potentially find some novel anti-aging therapy. But what's the, what's the barrier? So there are mainly three barriers. The first, we don't have the good biomarker. So uh, of course, we have a lot of aging clock recently, but uh, they are all like correlation-based, and we really need to have this causal sense. And second, we just don't have a unified database for this um, um, all the sample, all experiment with the biological age data available. And lastly, even if we have this database, all different labs, different experiments, they use different ways to annotate their samples. And it's just a chaos. There's no way, even if you have them, you, there's no way for you to analyze them in like one, one pass. So throughout my PhD, I really trying to tackle all these three problems. So first, let's look at the first problem. All the, so from previous talk, you probably already heard about the uh, epigenetic clock. Or like, uh, so we know that DNA methylation can be very nicely used to predict the age of the sample. But all the clock, all the current clock are the correlation-based. And uh, the correlation-based clock can have some problems. So here is an example. So here you can see that this is the correlation between the chocolate assumption rate and the Nobel Prize lowering number in the country. China is right here. And you can see uh, Chinese people don't, well, this from uh, 2012, 12, and at that time, Chinese people probably don't consume a lot of chocolate. And we also don't have a lot of uh, Nobel Prize laureate. You can see this model is quite accurate. The Pearson's R is 0.79, which is fairly accurate. But this is, I would, you can predict it's pretty bad at predicting intervention. For example, if it we suddenly encourage people to consume more chocolate, the, the prediction will start to move from x axis, but we don't expect we have any more like Nobel Prize lower number, right? So this is also the current challenge of the clock. So how do we derive uh, the causal insight from the clock? So uh, here we use the, uh, a causal inference approach called uh, Mandela randomization. So basically the idea is we take the genetic variant that have strong association with the DNA methylation level and also located near the DNA methylation site. And then we look at how this uh, genetic mutation, we use that as an instrument to study how they can affect healthy longevity. And by using this tool instrument, since this genetic variant are allocated randomly when passed from parent to offspring, so we, uh, this is basically, this, this is kind of mimicking the randomized control trial. So this use this principle, we, uh, we analyzed, we did this causal inference for more than um, 400,000 DNA methylation sites across the genome and uh, in a cohort with 27,000 people. So for each phenotype, we, drop, we, we also study multiple uh, lifespan related phenotypes. And for each phenotype, we actually find a lot of um, around the 3,000 methylation sites that are showing to have potential causal effect on lifespan. So for example, here, the to our top hit, so if it is above uh, x-axis, it means these have, you have higher methylation on this side will promote your longevity, and if it's below x-axis, it will means have higher methylation will 
the critical lifespan is COVID. So our topic is on the Huntington low side. So it's uh, related to the uh, bone mineral density from previous study. We also have some of those have some methodologies that are related to uh, Alzheimer disease. So they're really like a very diverse uh, mechanism across the genome and um, and from this information, we can also derive something else. So we, by putting the uh, causal inside, the causal effect on X axis and uh, their change during aging on the Y axis, we can really separate them, um, their role, like whether they are protective or adaptive, or whether they are damaging. So from this information, we built the uh, first uh, causality enriched model. So basically, we feed this causal information into our model. And we build three different ones. So we call it the uh, cause age, which use all the synergy side damage using only damaging methylation side, and the uh, adaptive age use only adaptive uh, adaptive methylation side. So if you just look at the ability to predict the age, they are quite similar. So they, all of them, all these three clocks can predict age. Uh, but when we apply them to mortality association, we are surprisingly find that the clock builds on adaptations are actually in, has an inverse correlation with uh, mortality. It means that you have higher age and with that age, you actually have more, less likely to die, which is, um, well, kind, kind of contradicting, right? Because we expect if a model predict age, people with higher predicted age, they should more likely to die. So here we really uh, show that we are able to detect these um, adaptive and uh, damaging changes. So in summary, we identify the putative causal signature side across the genome. We build the first causality enriched biomarker, and our work is currently in present in nature aging. And now we have first problem. Well, I wouldn't say I solve it, but uh, we kind of move, moving forward a little bit on this problem. And the second problem, right? Where well, there's no database, so we build one. So here we, we build, we, we call it clock based. So we, we, we collected all the uh, omic data, the DNA methylation data, and uh, gene expression data from GEO. So we have totally, now, it's, now the number is actually larger. So we currently have roughly 500,000 samples and more than 10,000 data set for both human and mouse methylation and uh, uh, gene expression. And we uh, standardize them and we, we, we run all the current clock models. So it's, more than 30 different aging clock models. Yes, we have a lot of aging clock models. And uh, we put it online, so it's on clock base, but you can access from China, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, so this is all the sample. So um, you can see the, the color is just the predicted age. So you can see it's really forming a kind of trajectory of sample. So the young sample are at this corner, and there's a split here, and both samples are here. So, and uh, more than that, some of the samples have age data available. So we really is able to uh, look into uh, whether these samples have accelerated age or decelerated age based on different clocks. So uh, yeah, all of these are on the website. And uh, besides this, we, we, we built a Python package called uh, Python library called BioLearn. So this is a, uh, we use it as a back end of clock base. We also pop, uh, open source it on GitHub. So it's a, it's a tool that you can, it's a centralized data set, uh, have like geo data or other from other sources, uh, data sources. And we also harmonize all the, well, most of the aging biomarker. And you can implement, implement them in a single line. And there's also some, uh, some useful analyzation code. And uh, just a little bit detour. So all, all, of, this, all of this work, I'm really trying to um, forward to the consensus of the aging biomarker. So we have our clock base feature by Nature Biotechnology a few months ago. And we, NJ already introduced, we have this aging biomarker of aging consortium. Uh, actually, it starts from our lab. So you can see Vadim is uh, uh, one of the scientific steering committee. And also Madi and Jesse are both postdoc from our lab. So we, we uh, the consortium have their first paper published on cell a few months ago, and we also actually we just had this symposium like a few days ago, and we announced the cloud uh, cloud builder uh, library there. So it's just it's a great tool. So I encourage you to use them. So both of them are are published on not published put on preprint this year. So feel free to check it out. And okay, we have a second problem solved. So last problem, uh, the metadata is not consistent. So, uh, 
probably everyone here knows GPT-4, right? So here we take advantage of the recent progress of the large language model. So we just take all the metadata, all the unstructured and semi-structured metadata from the clock base. We, we, we use some um, prompt engineering and some student-teacher model. Basically, we feed them to the GPT-4. We ask them to give us the standardized metadata. And then we have the standard metadata. So and this one is still ongoing. It's not an easy text. So now we kind of all have all the cards in hand. So now we kind of do the screen. So we did it. Only first for this is it's very preliminary. It's only for 10% of all the sample we have. So you can see uh, the X axis is a transcriptomic age, which is developed by Alex Chishkovsky from RNAP. So the right side are the interventions from previous study that accelerated aging. So you can see top one actually this APP PS1 transgenic is the Alzheimer model. And then we have, you have neural injury, you have this uh, amino acid high fat diet, you have this uh, different kind of uh, damaging intervention. And from left side, you have uh, anti aging therapy. So here we have a recommended system. And you may ask, is there anything new? Of course, there's anything new. We just didn't show it here. We are correctly studied it in lab. So we find a few compounds that had people previously never reported before to have effect on aging. But we show very nice uh, results based on various clock models. And we are currently also working together with the ITP, the intervention testing program, to test in, test in mouse. So this is pretty much all of my talk. I, I would need to thank uh, our lab member and our funding source of the time fine. And uh, here is an uh, uh, important link our vehicle here. The, the clock base website are here. And the uh, file is here. Please check it out and use it. And uh, my email is here. My Twitter is here. My WeChat is here. So if you have any problem, I want to collaborate or anything, feel free to come. So thank you. I will take questions. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm quite curious about the biomarker. So, uh, as you mentioned, you have like, selected some of the most useful biomarkers. But, uh, our daily use and uh, accessibility is to test which one do you think the best application would you like? Or do you have like a list of them? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a hard question. So, this is a kind of problem that the uh, Biomicro Aging Consortium is trying to address. So, we are, we are currently running a, well, next year, we're, we're, we're actually this year, we're end of this year, we're running a, a uh, Context. So basically, people will submit their clock and test it in a new data set we just generated. We have uh, all the phenotype, we have the mortality, but this data set never published before. So people's clock can be tested in this validation data set. And the winner will be, well, I would say the best clock for now, right? Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, I have a question. So, maintaining a randomization based on epigenome. Here. Hello. Uh, very nice. Uh, so, I want to ask uh, uh, we know uh, maintaining randomization uh, typically based on uh, SNP. Uh, you mentioned a new concept uh, based on uh, methylation. So, I think that I see. Uh, there, there, there has some difference uh, because uh, methylation uh, is it's formed uh, after the uh, environment effect. Uh, so I think uh, it is useful uh, to use it in the Mendelian randomization. So, so we still use SNPs, the genetic variant. So we just use the well. He, the difference here, the methylation is the molecular trait. So unlike the uh, general like complex trait, you have this complex trait are really polygenic. But methylation, you usually you find most most of the genetic associate, uh, association uh, loci around the methylation site itself. Because they're so close to the methylation site, they're very likely this, this mutation are affecting the methylation levels through some direct mechanisms, like maybe affecting the binding of certain like uh, methylation enzyme or something else. 
So we just take advantage of this. We use the mutation, this uh, natural genetic variant occurs around the methylation site, and we use this. So we, yes, we still use SNPs.